After falling in love with the blossoming punk scene, Buzzcocks took those ideas and essentially birthed a new musical genre, and they put Manchester music on the map. Without them, music would look completely different. This is the story of Buzzcocks. If you like this video, please consider giving it a like, and don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss out on more stories like this from music history. I tend to use a lot of sources whenever I make these videos, but for this video in particular, I used one source quite a bit, and that's this book, Autonomy by Steve Diggle. It's his new biography, memoir, whatever you want to call it, coming out from Omnibus Press. I think, depending on where you are, it's either coming out soon or already out. And the people at Omnibus Press actually did something really cool. They are offering to give one of you a copy of this book. All you have to do is click on the link in the description down below, and it'll take you to this landing page. You fill that out, you put your email address, and then you're entered for a chance to win. So it's really easy to do and definitely worth it. As you might imagine, considering this channel, I read a lot of music history books, a lot of artist memoirs. This one is really good. If you're familiar at all with Buzzcocks or Steve Diggle, you'll kind of get an idea of the tone of voice that he uses in this book. It's full of so many interesting stories. I highly suggest checking it out. They're not paying me to say anything nice about it. They just said, hey, you can give this to one of the people who watch the videos. And I was like, awesome. But after reading it, definitely worth you entering. So don't forget to do that in the description below. In February of 1976, two students in Manchester saw a review written in the New Musical Express by Neil Spencer talking about this new London-based band that was more into chaos than music and took a lot of inspiration from the Stooges. So that weekend, Howard Trafford and Peter McNeish borrowed a car, drove down to London in the hopes of finding this exciting new music. Howard was born in 1952 in Scunthorpe. He had always enjoyed music, first falling in love with The Shadows before moving on to people like Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones. He started a band in high school, which was like kind of a joke band with Richard Boone called The Earnest Band, named after one of his teachers. In 1972, he went to the Bolton Institute of Technology to try and get a psychology degree, but that wasn't really working out, though it was when he first heard The Stooges. He did end up going back to Bolton for a humanities degree, which was how he met Pete. Peter was born in the Greater Manchester area in 1955. When he was 15, he picked up a guitar that his father had bought as a birthday present for his younger brother. He wrote in his diary, quote, Today I will start to learn to play the guitar, end quote, which he did. His mother remembered him spending almost every day in his room learning how to play, primarily teaching himself from Beatles chord songbooks. He joined a band with some high school friends called Cog that actually got to play a few local gigs. After that, he formed a group with Garth Davies called White Light, eventually becoming Jets of Air. Of course, White Light taken from the Velvet Underground, White Light, White Heat, so so it's pretty clear to see where his influences were at that time. Through playing with Jets of Air, Pete learned a lot about how to set up gigs and how to organize band rehearsals, stuff that would become really important for Buzzcocks down the line. Then he also enrolled in the Bolton Institute of Technology to study electronics. Howard wasn't necessarily enjoying school, so he started looking for some distractions. He put out a notice looking for other students who were interested in the same type of music as him. Bands like The Velvet Underground, The Stooges, Mark Bolin, David Bowie. Howard said, quote, possibly Pete was the only person who answered that advert. No, he wasn't the only person, but he was the only person I kind of stuck with, end quote. So the two of them bonded over the shared love of music and Howard's desire to play covers of Velvet Underground songs just for fun. And that's when they saw that ad in NME. They decided to head down to London and try and find the Sex Pistols, which is a decision that would change the course of music. After hunting down the band's manager, Malcolm McLaren, to find out where they were actually playing that weekend, the guys first saw the Sex Pistols play that Friday night and were amazed. That gig, because it was the Pistols, ended up in a little bit of a scuffle, which completely blew Howard and Pete away. They were so amazed and shocked and awed by what they saw that they arranged to see the Pistols play again the next night. On the way home from those two gigs, Howard and Pete became completely bought in to punk music. 
They even changed their names. Peter McNeish became Pete Shelley because Shelley was the name his mom was going to call him if he was a girl. Howard Trafford became Howard DeVoto, the name of a bus driver from a story his philosophy teacher told him. When they got back to Manchester, nothing could stop them from forming a band for themselves. Howard said, quote, Pete and I immediately had a model. When we saw the Pistols, we'd got a musical model. Pete added, quote, We saw them doing it and we thought, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Howard and I decided that we would make it happen rather than just writing songs and not doing anything. End quote. It helped that they had a deadline because they had already met Malcolm. They asked him about the possibility of bringing the Sex Pistols to Manchester to play a show. Malcolm said if they arranged it and found a place, the Pistols would show up and do it. So Howard booked the Lesser Free Trade Hall on June 4th, 1976, largely because he wanted this new band that he was inspired to start to be able to open for the Sex Pistols. They just needed to get a group ready to play by then. They found the perfect name for their group by reading a review of a TV show called Rock Follies that said, it's the buzz, cock. Howard thought that that vague kind of semi-sexual phrase would make a great band name, so they became Buzzcocks. They recruited Pete's friend and fellow Jet of Air, Garth Davies, to play bass and made their debut on April 1st. Fitting that it was on April Fool's Day because the whole gig was kind of a joke. It was at their school, it was like an event for the students, and they pulled in Mick Singleton, who was a drummer for a local band, to play drums for them. They were so bad that the event organizers pulled the plug on them after three songs. Garth said, quote, I decided there and then that the band wasn't for me, and told Peter a couple of days later, end quote. So now, with one disastrous gig under their belt, no drummer and no bassist, Buzzcox felt pretty confident that they weren't going to be able to open for the Pistols in like less than a month, but they still wanted to put on the gig. They organized everything, Howard runs the lights, Pete takes tickets at the door, and that gig at the Lesser Free Trade Hall on June 4th of 1976 launched the Manchester music scene. It's hard to know exactly who was there, but by most accounts, Mark E. Smith was there and he went on to start The Fall. Morrissey was there, who went on to start The Smiths. Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook were there, who went on to start Joy Division and New Order. Tony Wilson was maybe there, who went on to start Factory Records and become just like a linchpin in the Manchester underground scene. It's an event that honestly deserves an entire video to itself, but I do talk about it more in the Joy Division video, so I'll link that below as well. That gig and the follow-up show that we'll get to in a little bit sparked everything in Manchester. It's hard to overstate just how important it was for the history of music. And if you want more information about that, I highly recommend this book, I Swear I Was There, by David Nolan. It's a really good account. He interviews so many people who claim to have been there or were there. It just kind of explains how it happened, what it was like, what it spawned. It's just, it's really fascinating to read. Highly recommend you check that out if you're interested. But we know for sure one person was there, even though he was there accidentally, and it changed his life. Steve Diggle was born in May of 1955 in Manchester. His dad was a Korean war vet and a lorry driver. His mom owned a shop that sold children's clothes, but she was way too generous to people who couldn't pay, so the shop ended up folding. When he was seven or eight, he first heard the Beatles at a friend's house, and that completely changed his life. He wrote, quote, I suddenly saw it all. Music, girls, the melodies, the future, a lifestyle awakening, end quote. In school, he felt pretty hopeless. The only future he saw was the future that most... Manchester residents had, and that was working in factories, coming home to your wife and kids, slowly growing old, and that's not something he ever wanted. He wanted to break free of that entirely. He did get really into riding scooters, but he got arrested and the police thought he might be involved in this ring that was doing a whole lot of scooter thefts in the area, so he lost his license, which led to him spending way more time at home working on music because he didn't really have anything else to do. He found an old Spanish guitar in like a secondhand music shop and just started plucking away, teaching himself how to play little songs that he liked. Once he graduated, he spent most of his time either hanging out at the pub with his friends or in his room trying to learn how to play the guitar. There really wasn't another option for him. He got a job at a factory Factory, but kept getting fired because he hated it so much. There's a funny story he recounts in the book about he would get fired and then the other workers would organize around him and uh, strike until the factory agreed to hire him back. But he was very upset about that because he's like, I don't want to be hired back, but I can't really tell you not to do the Just funny story. Lots of that in the book entered for a chance to win it. His dad is kind of like a kind gesture, stole what he thought was a better guitar out of his lorry. Turns out it wasn't a guitar, it was a bass, but his dad did know the difference. 
Steve tried his best to find other people who wanted to take music seriously, but it was a real struggle. No one else was nearly as dedicated as him. They thought it was just something fun to do on the weekends, whereas he wanted to make it his entire life. He saw an ad in the Manchester Evening News that said Basis Wanted. He wrote, quote, I wasn't really a bassist, just the owner of a stolen one, but I thought that'll do. I was willing to try and form a band with absolutely anyone. End quote. So he called the number and arranged to meet the ad poster at a pub, but the guy who posted the ad didn't know where that pub was, so Steve said, let's meet at the Free Trade Hall and then I'll walk over with you. So on June 4th, 1976, Steve Diggle is standing outside of the Free Trade Hall with no idea that the Sex Pistols are playing there that night when Malcolm McLaren walks out. According to Steve, Malcolm walked up to him and said, the Sex Pistols are in there. Steve told him, oh no, I'm not here for any show. I'm actually meeting someone because I'm supposed to talk to him about forming a band since I'm a bass player. And Malcolm said, yeah, I know, he's waiting in there. Steve was pretty confused about that, but he thought maybe the guy showed up early, and then he went inside to see the Sex Pistols, whoever they were, while he was waiting, so he followed Malcolm in. That's when Malcolm introduced Steve to Pete Shelley by saying, I found him outside, he's your new bass player. So that night, Steve saw the Sex Pistols perform, and he met Pete Shelley and Howard DeVoto, and that's essentially where Buzzcock started. And it was all an accident, because the guy who posted that ad that Steve responded to was not Peter Howard. It was some other random guy, and Malcolm just kind of swooped in and took Steve away from that. Steve talked about his perspective on Howard and Pete's different personalities. He said that Howard was way more philosophical and arty. He said, quote, No question he was a very intelligent, very philosophical bloke, but I'm not sure it did him a lot of good in the end. He always seemed to be troubled or a a bit self-contained. Meanwhile, Pete was more of a pub type, as Steve called it, and the two of them got along really well since they were the same age. Howard was a couple years older, and they could play off of each other and have a lot of the same reference points. So the backbone of the group was there, but they still needed a drummer if they were going to be ready to play the next Pistols gig on July 20th. So Howard invited in 16-year-old student John Marr. John was born in 1960 in Manchester, and he originally played guitar, but after he tried and failed to join several bands, he noticed that most bands were looking for drummers, so he traded all of his guitar equipment to buy a drum set and taught himself to play by playing along to records in his front room. When the neighbors complained about him playing drums, in his front room, he realized that he needed a band to rehearse with to kind of get him out of the house, so he looked through ads in Melody Maker and found one placed by Howard. They all clicked with him right away. He was kind of a perfect fit for what they were looking to do, so with the band in place, they were ready to open for the Sex Pistols on July 20th, 1976. After that performance, they started getting some positive attention basically right away. John was so hyped up at the end of their set that he jumped over his drum set and just ran out of the Lesser Free Trade Hall though John says that the rest of the guys told him to do that. Pete said about that gig, quote, It was really all about seeing what you could get away with. It's remarkable how much you can get away with before people say, stop, stop. I'm still waiting for them to say stop, end quote. So because of Malcolm McLaren and the Sex Pistols, they already had some really good connections within the burgeoning punk scene. They got to play with the Pistols again in August, which happened to be the debut of this new band called The Clash. Steve wrote about that show, quote, For me, that gig was the crystallization of the whole punk explosion. End quote. So Buzzcocks quickly became a staple of the punk revolution that was sweeping through the UK, but they also became essentially the fathers of the punk community within Manchester. They were the band that everything else orbited around within Manchester. And eventually they decided it was time to make a record. Since most of the labels were London-based and not paying any attention to Manchester, it felt natural for the band to just do it themselves. They figured they were doing everything else themselves anyway, so why not try this? So with some financing help from Pete's dad, they go to Indigo Studios to record their debut EP with Martin Hannett. Called a Spiral Scratch, they released the EP in January of 1977. They figured out that it would cost about 500 or 600 pounds to record and manufacture 1,000 copies, so if they sold all of those for one pound each, they'd make a profit. They sold about 16,000 of them, mostly by mail order. They even became the first punk band to set up their own record label to release it when they created New Hormones Records. That move, which opened the door for other punk bands to make truly revolutionary music, changed the scene completely. Pete said, quote, By exercising your will, you can make things happen. So everything which has happened since is as a direct result of that end quote. So, Buzzcocks were on the rise. They had a hit new EP, the ability to play with almost any punk band they wanted, and a very dedicated fan base in Manchester. But everything came to a sudden stop when Pete and Steve showed up to Howard's place, and he 
very casually told them that he was leaving the group. He said that he'd done all he wanted to do with the band. Howard said, quote, I felt at the time that having recorded the record, that's maybe as far as it could go for me. I'd now seen through quite a lot of the whole process of being in a band, playing a gig, and then making a record, end quote. Howard would go on to form arguably the first post-punk band magazine. In later years, admits different magazine reunions, he would move to London and find work as a photo archive director. But instead of stopping Buzzcocks with their lead singer stepping away, Steve and Pete made the very important decision to carry on. And they thought that bringing in a new singer would dramatically change the sound of the band. They decided that Pete would just take over singing. During this shakeup, Steve decided to move to rhythm guitar and they brought back in Garth Davies to play bass. Buzzcocks then set out on the White Riot tour with The Clash, which kind of felt like the culmination of the punk revolution. At least to Steve. He wrote, quote, Lost in that moment, you genuinely felt that it was something that was going to change the world. And even if it didn't change the world, it changed ours. End quote. Because of the success of Spiral Scratch and their really well-attended live shows, major labels were starting to pay attention to Buzzcocks, but they held out until they found the perfect deal with artistic freedom. Finally, in August of 1977, they signed a United Artist. A few months later, Pete and Garth's relationship basically crumbled. Garth said, quote, The relationship between me and Pete had deteriorated to the point where there was open animosity. End quote. Garth started drinking way too much and missing shows. It got to the point where he dreaded being on stage with Buzzcocks. During one show, he smashed his bass into the equipment and then walked off stage. And that was the last time that he played with Buzzcocks. On the recommendation of The Fall, who were borrowing his equipment, Buzzcocks set up an audition for Steve Garvey. According to Steve Diggle, Steve Garvey, who I'll call Patty from now on since other people did that, only got the job because he bought John a Mars bar. Basically, there were two bassists who were very close. It could have gone either way. It was a coin flip on which one they would pick. John offered to walk Patty out after his audition, so Steve and Pete were kind of debating which basis they should go with when John comes back and says that he liked that second guy because in the corner shop, he bought him a candy bar. So that's how Patty became a Buzzcock. On March 3rd, 1978, Buzzcocks finally released their debut album. Called Another Music in a Different Kitchen, the band worked with producer Martin Russians and it was preceded by several really popular singles. The critical praise was immediate for this record. It was called a punk classic straight away. Right after that album came out, they hit the cycle of always touring. It's tour, stop to record an album or a single, go back out on tour, rinse and repeat. Somewhere in the midst of all of that touring and recording and drug use and the grind of being in an up-and-coming band, Pete started to feel a little bit frustrated by Buzzcock's output and he wanted a different creative outlet. So he started a group called the Tiller Boys with his flatmate Francis Cookson, who, at least according to Steve Diggle, was also his boyfriend and potentially the inspiration for Ever Fallen in Love. They released Ever Fallen in Love later that year as a single and even though Steve appreciates the song and still thinks it's a good song he's a little bit frustrated by the amount of attention it gets as if it's the best thing that the band ever did though it's probably the biggest they followed that single up with another album in september of 1978 called love bites it was another really big success steve said that he was so wrapped up in partying and his relationship with his then girlfriend that pete really carried the torch for love bites and it's largely because of pete that the album happened at all they spent about two weeks on it and it became their best-selling album reaching number 13 but after that album things really started taking a toll on pete he was increasingly frustrated with having to write only three minute pop songs over and over again. He was falling more and more into drug use and suffering from pretty bad writer's block, struggling to write any songs at all for Buzzcocks. Steve wrote, quote, Pete was going through his own psychological meltdown and he wouldn't let any of us in. He never did, end quote. They also started to become more distanced from their fans, racking up excessive touring bills because of their luxurious traveling style and really not imbibing the spirit of punk any longer by creating their own label and doing things their way they removed that distance between fan and band but as they got bigger it kind of spread a little bit more and all of those attitudes are reflected in their third album called a different kind of tension released in 1979 Though it did get the most positive critical reviews, it was their worst-selling album. It kind of signaled the end of Pete Shelley as the romantic. The songs Steve wrote, which were more upbeat, traditional Buzzcock songs, were all on one side while the angst-ridden Pete songs were on the other, giving it, truly, a different kind of tension. Steve Diggle still 
hates that album. That year, they also released a compilation album called Singles Going Steady, which was just like a collection of their singles that they could release in the U.S. market before their first U.S. tour so the audiences could know what they were in for. At the end of 1979, with Pete really in a rough mental and physical state, Buzzcocks announced that they would be taking a year off from touring. Most of the crew kind of suspected that that would be the end of the group. They started working on their fourth album amidst a cloud of drug abuse. Pete said, quote, I got very withdrawn. I painted myself into a corner as far as the songs went. There were times when we wouldn't start work until 12 o'clock because we were waiting for the drugs. End quote. For this album, they returned to work with Martin Hannett, who had produced their Spiral Scratch EP, and in the time since, he had made quite a name for himself as the producer for Factory Records, but he had also developed a really serious heroin addiction, and that made him really unreliable, so Martin Russian had to step in and kind of salvage whatever he could for the album. Him and Pete went away together to try and work on fixing what they could. The band's management at this time were also making some poor business decisions. They were funneling more and more money into the New Hormones label for creative projects from their friends that were never going to be commercially successful or see a return on that money. Everything was all kind of falling apart. Steve tried to call Martin and Pete several times and ask them what's going on with the album, what do we need to do, what are the next steps, and started getting no answer back. That was when Pete hired a lawyer to write a letter letting the rest of the band know that he quit. And that stuff he was doing with Martin kind of separated from the rest of the band became the basis for his solo work. After the breakup, Pete started a solo career, Steve and John started a band called Flag of Convenience, Patty started a short-lived band called Motivation before joining a group called Blue Orchids and moving to New York City. After leaving Flag of Convenience, John played in a couple of groups, but eventually he left music behind and opened a car tuning and racing shop in Scotland. Through most of the 80s, Steve continued on with Flag of Convenience without John, but called it FOC. Because of a mix-up with a promoter in France, that group started to be billed as Buzzcocks FOC to like bring in more fans and at first Steve was a little bit worried that that would rub people the wrong way since him and Pete weren't exactly on speaking terms at that point but it turns out it actually inspired the group to get back together. I will say that just because it's what I'm the most interested in I really like to focus on the early days so I'm not going to talk much about this reunion. There's tons of information you can learn about it so I let me know if you want some resources but We'll just kind of briefly cover this reunion period. The old lineup of Steve, Pete, Patty, and John reunited for a while, but John left pretty early after a few tour dates because he was kind of done with music. He was enjoying his car customization business. Eventually, Patty left because he had a family in New York and he couldn't keep going over to England to work on Buzzcocks. But Steve and Pete carried on, getting in new members and putting out new albums. Pete did eventually get married to an Estonian woman and he moved to Estonia in the early 2000s. In December of 2018, Pete passed away from a suspected heart attack. Not long before that, he had a conversation with Steve about stepping away from the band, and Pete made it pretty clear that he was totally fine with Steve carrying on. So, after a whole lot of deliberation and heartache, that's what Steve decided to do. As well as writing a really good book, Steve is continuing to keep Buzzcocks alive. So that's the very abridged story of Buzzcocks. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Also, Please remember to enter for a chance to win that book. It's incredible. It's well worth the read. Just to hear the story of Buzzcocks from Steve Diggle is incredibly valuable. So I would highly recommend you do that. It's free. There's nothing to it. Just filling out a little form. Link in the description below. Make sure you do that. Subscribe so you don't miss out on more stories like this from music history. And leave a like if you enjoyed the video.